show. Um, and welcome to the Faith Feed. Um, and I would like to just say thank you for coming and thank you for being here. As Adrian and I strolled around Circular Quay with the kids on one of our usual adventures, as he likes to call them, a person clothed in rags beside twin garbage bags of what seemed to be her life's possessions slept near the shelter of the ferry wharf. Amelia, who was five at the time, was the one who called it just after we walked past. You know that scene, how a child can stare back oblivious to you with an onlooking audience and everyone's watching and she yells out, Mum, who's that? Why is she dirty? Why is she there? Red-faced, I moved her from the crowd and explained that she was homeless, only to get the response of, um, I already know that, but why? Where's her family? And why don't they help her? A few questions continued as we strolled on, and Amelia seemed happy with the answers that we thought were about fair for a five-year-old to handle. We spoke about how lucky she was and used the opportunity to teach her about blessings. We only realised that night, however, as we sat down for our um, dinner, how much she had carried it. Thank you, God, for a good day, for safe arrival home and for this meal were the usual lines led by Adrian and I around the dinner table, to which Amelia added, um, and thank you that we're not homeless like the lady in the city. Amelia clearly got it. She got that she was lucky and she got that she was blessed. But it hit us hard that her realisation was coming from a comparison with someone who seemingly wasn't. What might that say to a little mind? even to our adult minds, about the value of one person compared to another. I'm a school teacher, so I always like to incorporate a good story wherever I can. And I used a story that night, but I think it was as much for us as it was for the kids. It's a story by Max Licardo that I like to read to my class at the beginning of each year, and it helps set the tone and assure the kids about their value to me. It's about the Wimix, a small type of people carved from wood, each one different. Perhaps they have a bigger nose, shorter legs, some with a hat, a smile, or a frown. But nevertheless, all of them were made by Eli the woodcarver, and he sat in his workshop at the top of the village hill. The Wimix gave each other stickers, though, every day, grey dots or golden stars. Dots for silly and clumsy actions, stars for clever and impressive things. Dots if they were messy, but stars if they were slick. Punchinello, who was one of the Wimmicks, he only ever got grey dots. Dots for falling over, for not understanding quickly enough, for not being strong enough, and even for his paint chipping off. Although one day he met Lucia, and when anyone tried to give her a sticker, it never stuck. It always fell off. Punchinello wanted that for himself too. So he spoke with Lucia and she put it down to her visiting the woodcarver each day, the one who made all the Wimmicks. And she suggested that Punchinello go see for himself. Long story short, Punchinello goes up the hill to look for this woodcarver who, upon arrival, amazingly calls out to him by his name. And even more amazingly, he showed that he was totally wrapped that Punchinello had finally come to visit him. As they chat, Eli tells him that he never planned for the Wimmicks to use stickers because he was the one who made them and he didn't make mistakes. He assured Punchinello that if he visited all the time, he'd learn to trust Eli's view of him and not care about the stickers. Then you'll realise, he said, that the stickers only stick if you let them. That's the short version of the story, but enough to turn it into an adult one that how I see myself can depend on the narrative of me that sticks. Punchinella had to spend some time learning his own story, but it was through the narrative of Eli's eyes on him, through the narrative of the way Eli knew him. My spiritual ancestry, and similar for many here today, includes the long journey in the desert of the Israelite people who escaped slavery. And through the ups and downs of many years, they continued to hope for a promised land. 
You know, the more I think about it, and the more I think about those stories, the more they become powerful metaphors for our lives today. Because as those people became dejected, or tried to go it alone, or created their own idols in search for happiness, some rare characters kept emerging. The prophets. The ones who gave the Israelites glimpses of God's view towards them. The ones who spoke to their searching. They reminded the Israelites that God wanted them to know things like, if you seek me with your heart, you will find me. I will never abandon you. Do not fear, I have called you by your name. And one of the most remarkable assurances of God's voice they got was that each one of them, and likewise us here today, was wonderfully made in God's image. That's like saying that if the person sitting next to you right now wants to get a glimpse of God, all they have to do is look inside your eyes and inside your heart. Now, I'm not sure how that would work during a mad midweek breakfast in my household with three kids and us trying to get out of the door on time, but it's pretty humbling to know that that's how our maker sees us. If I really heard that though and took it in each day, that I'm actually God's image, I wonder how it would influence the ongoing change and courage in the next steps of my own story. It would mean trying to look at myself through the lens of my source, through the lens of my maker. Like when we receive God's spirit, that our stories alongside each other could be narratives alongside God almost. That we could be protagonists and co-creators with God, with the power to influence our circumstance and that of others. A story in church one morning stands out for me as exactly that. The founder of a movement called Destiny Rescue had us glued. He told of young women who were sold by their parents as sex slaves in the areas of South Asia. He described what he called mission trips, but these mission trips were nothing like I had ever heard of or nothing like any typical image I'd ever had. These mission trips had men posing as customers in brothels again and again in order to build a connection and a trust with these girls. Bit by bit, a new narrative of hope and livelihood for them. The guy then began to explain about these pairs of shoes along the corridors of these places. You see, the shoes, they gave the customers an indication of the age and size of the girl available behind each door. Then he told us of this one door, and more specifically, this pair of red shoes. These shoes, he said, would have belonged to a girl no more than seven years old. He told the story of her village, her family background, their oppression, their devalued sense of personhood of her parents, generation after generation slipping further from basic hope. I was trying really hard to hear what this guy had to say, but I was so angry and I was beginning to shut down. How could any parent sell their child and expose them to such treatment? Let alone, how could anyone start a business dependent on such exploitation? I felt tears running down my face as I heard my daughter, Tida, who was sitting on my lap. But you know what, it was this extreme example of the red shoes in the story that led me through my anger and my numbness to action. Those red shoes began to take on a clear and focus for me. Now let me tell you, when my husband and I have or get an idea into our head, usually takes a couple of weeks of convincing from one party to the other to get the other party on board, especially when it's got to do with money. But I tell you what, that day when we left the church, we were both convicted to help and support this courageous protagonist of change, to be in some small way co-creators of a new narrative for those girls, from a story where they were no longer objects and slaves, to one through the lens of God which narrates that everyone, bar none, is as precious as the next. And so Amelia's question that day at Circular Quay and our best attempts to respond led that night to an adult question. Yeah, we realised the importance of giving thanks for what we have and for blessings. And that's what we did as a family that night. Surely doing that kind of thing each day can be part of what keeps any of us being positive people. 
But it still left the question about how we approach the value of one person compared to another. Because all I kept hearing was Amelia's prayer about the homeless person or the homeless lady that was now in the dark. I couldn't help thinking it sounded like I'd been saying thanks for our situation, almost as a way of not thinking further of the other. Was I unconsciously putting a lesser value on that person as my way of coping with the difficult situation? I'm sure I'm not the only person here who gets challenged by this stuff. I ended up having a chat with a friend about this and they added a further thought that people can often look for easy diversions from thinking about the plight of others because they're loaded up with enough stuff of their own and enough of their own responsibilities. So someone might feel sad seeing a person who's desperately homeless, but move on fairly quickly with what might even be an unconscious thought. For example, you know what, that person probably made bad choices along the way. Or, they can get help, all they have to do is ask. Anyway, I've begun using a couple of code words that are proving to be a bit helpful when I see a difficult situation and feel powerless. It's not a solution by any means, but it's a starting point. My words, you might have guessed it, are red shoes. And when I see the difficult situation, my little code just makes me consciously pause. It makes me wonder. And it makes me realise a bit more deeply that each person has a story. Sometimes a hidden story, sometimes a story connected back to so many other things. As I said, it's just a starting point. But doing that step of consciousness more consistently is making a difference for me. It's helping diffuse a bit of judgement. Or that quick answer syndrome at the times when, I might, when it might be my way of coping. And it's helping me focus a bit more on what I've got in common with that other person, even though we're different. The other thing about this attempt at consciousness is the realisation more and more that this is how God views me. That God is always conscious of my story. All of it. Even the bits that I don't want on Facebook. I'm appreciating that this same God never stopped saying to me what Punchinello learned in the story that the stickers will only stick if you let them. And God never stops saying, here, have my spirit as yours. I'll always let people believe that you are a part of what I look like. So I guess the key things I'm hearing myself thinking about are the power of story. The other person's story, my story, and God's eyes on and in both. I know it's not the life task of any of us here to sort out all of the world's problems. Everyone knows that there's way too many, and trust me, I know I'm not God. But allowing my consciousness of other stories to remind me that God loves me in mine and truly trusts me as an image of God, that is something that does potentially keep changing something in me. It makes me look at others around me too. It makes me realise that if we are all images of God, together, then together in God's creative power, then we are much more than the sum of a lot of individuals. Maybe it's the people who really trust that they are God's presence and really are more together, who can do remarkable things for others beyond what they can even imagine. Remarkable things not just because they were overwhelmed and had to tick their social responsibility boxes, but remarkable things because they would just be, or being, who they are, who we are. We are all images of God's presence. We are hearts of God's abundant spirit. We are a solidarity in a joy that's forever, a forever that's already here and beginning today. So here's to the red shoes, and here's to the code words that you might use in order to remember God's view of you and unite us more and more together as one. <laughs>